Hello and welcome to Channels Book Club. I'm Olapunle Kasumo. Thank you for joining us as always. Today we'll be talking to one of the most prominent authorities in Nigeria's publishing industry via Skype and also conclude on the interview we started last week with a biographer of a legendary music star. I'll be introducing them soon. But before then, let's have our brain teaser for the week. A question we frequently come across is, what is e-publishing? We have given time to discuss some traditional publishing on this show, but what is e-publishing? This is an important topic in today's world because everything is going digital. Gone are the days when the only option we had for books, magazines, newspapers, and journals were printed or paper forms. Nowadays, there are e-versions of them and they are gradually taking over. So, what is e-publishing? E-publishing is short for electronic publishing. It refers to the many different ways that publishers or others can publish books, articles, or other types of literature as digital content. Information is distributed by means of a computer network or is produced in a format for use with a computer. Another way you can describe e-publishing is to say that it is the production of books, magazines, newspapers, and so on that can be read using a computer or a digital gadget. For example, on the internet or CD or any other digital media. So what exactly are the benefits of this type of publishing? Uh, benefits will include it is comparatively easier to get published through e-publishing than traditional publishing. Last week, I spoke a lot about traditional publishing, how difficult it can be. But e-publishing is a lot easier comparatively. There are more hurdles to cross to get traditionally published than to get e-published. It is also comparatively cheaper. Electronic publishing has removed much of the costs and risks involved in print publishing. Let's say a typical example. It costs a lot of money to print a book physically. But to create an ebook is a lot easier. I mean, the, the costs are not comparable. It's a, so far, far cheaper to, to create an ebook than to go to a printer, pay for X numbers of copies to be printed. It's a lot more expensive that way. Now, the magic of multimedia can be included in electronic publishing. Um, multimedia elements such as graphics, animation, audio, short video clips, music, or expandable photos can elevate the quality of electronic publishing and illustrate the textual content more effectively. You don't have this luxury in print publishing as much as you have in e-publishing. Now, in e-publishing, you can tap the worldwide market through the internet to advertise and market your ebook. That's easy to understand. Imagine how simple it is to click and send. You know, an ebook can be clicked and sent, can be promoted so much easily through the internet. The internet is a powerful medium for promoting ebooks. Traditional books too use the internet, but Ebooks are e-products, so they're a lot easier to move around and promote on the internet. Now, since the cost of electronic publishing is significantly low, an author can expect a higher income from the sale of an e-book. If an author decides to pay for the creation of his e-book upfront and distributes the work on his own, he gets to keep all the profits. A lot of self-publishing is e-publishing. It, uh, it's a lot easier to self-publish through e-publish. If you have a book right now, if you have the manuscript of your book right now, you can transform it into an e-book and put it on the internet and your book is up there. You're a self-publisher, your book is up there. Uh, now imagine and compare that with finding somebody who can authenticate whether it's a good material, get, a, get you an editor, go through the whole process of traditional publishing, looking for a printer that can print, and then how to physically market and distribute your printed material. 
You know, they have their pros and cons, but uh, the, the differences are very, very clear. Another benefit of e-publishing is that content is easy to update. Editing electronically published content can be done at any time. So readers can keep up with the changes and updates. So you can see that the, the benefits of e-publishing are quite a, a lot. So uh, if you are thinking of getting your book out and getting it out very quickly, much more easily than going to press and printing and going after a traditional publisher, e-publishing is the way to go. Uh, and it's quite straightforward. You just need, you might just need somebody who can help you through the process. Or you could simply go on the internet and do a bit of self-study and you'll find out it's easy to do, really. Now, talking about electronic publishing, book fairs, which are primarily um, the meeting platforms for publishers and other players in the book industry all over the world have been badly hit by the global COVID-19 situation. And it's not just book fairs alone, book festivals, author conferences, book summits, and so on. But the positive consequence of the COVID-19 situation is that most players in the publishing industry have come to realize that much can be done through digital and electronic platforms. Conferences, summits, festivals, and book fairs are now being held online. In Nigeria, the annual Nigeria International Book Fair, which is always held at the University of Lagos, will now take place virtually, and thousands of people and stakeholders are already set to take part in it. The world will never remain the same again. Joining us today via Skype to discuss new developments and the impact of COVID-19 on the publishing industry in Nigeria is Bade Gade Dakwa, who is the president of the Nigeria Publishers Association and chairman of the Nigerian Book Fair Trust. Bade Gade Dakwa is also a member of the International Publishers Association Executive Committee. He's also chair, IPA Inclusive Publishing and Literacy Committee. Enjoy this conversation we had with Bade Gade. Mr. Adedakwa, nice to have you on Channels Book Club. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. Great. Um, the, I mean, the whole world has been shaking in this year, 2020. Almost every industry imaginable. I'm curious to know how this has affected the publishing sector um, generally, what has COVID-19 done to the publishing sector in 2020? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Yeah, it's not in news again. Uh, the pandemic has affected almost every industry, uh, whether big, small, uh, but the book industry may be one of the hardest hits they pass because of the format at which we publish in this part of the world, since we are more of physical books than digital. Maybe, uh, you know, this challenge, uh, you know, definitely when you are in this kind of a problem, you know, for a reasonable person, it will uh, chase you out of your complacency. You know, I think we've been embracing uh, digital publishing before now, uh, maybe we may likely be in a better shape, but uh, uh, well, there's no point in going to that, or it's like a, we are badly affected. No story about that. Um, all over the world, events okay. have been cancelled. Um, some yeah. of the biggest international book fairs have been cancelled. Um, Book festivals have been cancelled. Publishing conferences yes. have been cancelled. You know, all yes. over the world. I mean, the world. We've never seen this this before. The the London Book yes. Fair, which should have held earlier on, cancelled, and so many other yes. book fairs all all over the world. How how do you see this? Well, as a matter of fact, you know, we thought before now that uh, you know what this. Uh, virtual thing a whole life thing cannot do for us is what a physical you know a gathering will do for us 
it's like a, it seems as if uh, we don't really understand what may likely happen in the future. But, but now we now realize that uh, uh, having this, uh, embracing this information technology, you know, uh, uh, before now uh, will even be the best for us because most of the events, you know, few days to the uh, program, you may need to cancel because of uh, your inavailability. I mean, maybe probably because of one thing or the other. But, but now, uh, with this uh, uh, invisible enemy now, uh, we don't have anything that to go back and you know, change you know, the narrative. So I think uh, we don't have choice because it's not our own making. This is natural and we don't have a solution to read. It's uh, only God that can, you know, uh, uh, change the, the, the situation. Okay. The, well, one, of the, one of the events also hit um, is the Nigerian International Book Fair, which, I mean, everybody in the industry looks forward to every year. And it did not hold this year. How has that affected things? And I understand there is a backup plan in the next few days that will kick into effect. Uh, yeah, the uh, this uh, event, even especially what we have in mind to do this year, you know, we we, we already you know uh, finished our plans. You know, we scaled up seriously this time around. You know, we even changed our venue from a uh, light to other point. You know where we can you know entertain you know appreciable number of uh, exhibitors and uh, visitors but it's like uh, you know as god we have it uh, we have to cancel because uh we believe so much in the well-being the survival I mean, uh the existence of our people than the event itself because it's like if we're alive definitely we have opportunity you know uh to uh, to uh organize uh, physical uh events but as a matter of fact you know, we just have to leverage on the, you know, uh, the opportunities, you know, we have in the information technology. And uh, we, we don't have choice. It wasn't just uh, because we are unable to meet again physically, we won't uh, discharge our duties. We now intend to, uh, you know, come up with uh, this uh, virtual fair, which is going to hold uh, between 1st of uh, September to uh, uh, 7th September 2020. But, it, we, we decided to make it free to attend, free to exhibit, you know, uh, you know, we just have to do this, you know, to support, you know, the development of education so, and literacy in Nigeria. So virtual Although, book fair is taking over the physical book fair? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Well, fantastic. So, I, I, so, I, I, and I'm, I'm sure this is the first of its kind in Nigeria, isn't it? I've never heard of a virtual yeah. book fair before. Yeah, exactly. This is the first of its kind. Uh, you know, sadly, this may not likely be the last. This is a fact. This may not likely be the last. And uh, and uh, we we designed the program this time around to accommodate thousands of participants and exhibitors from Nigeria and beyond. A book fair without borders. Exactly. This time around, no barrier, no barrier. Anywhere you are, even this time around, is going to be a fantastic one. You know, it's like a, we are changing the narrative in Nigeria. You know, people are used to, you know, uh, getting grocery, uh, phones, uh, everything online for now. But I want to change the narrative of the publishing sector as well, so that people can sit at the you know, come from their house and receive their books. Because, uh, you know, uh, FIA is going to have three elements as usual. You know, conference, uh, you know, training for the stakeholders, and the exhibition per se. So that uh, whoever, you know, uh, have a position of visiting the fair, you know, can buy any book, you know, online, and they will deliver, you know, uh, to them their different houses. So that just the... That, that's that's that Unfortunately, we don't have time. I would. I wanted to engage you on the theme of the book fair, information technology as a panacea for the book industry's sustainability um, amidst yeah. COVID nineteen pandemic. That's a mouthful, <laughs> but uh, I mean, it sounds so interesting. 
that you'll be looking at how the um, how COVID-19 um, has impacted things within the publishing and book, book industry in Nigeria. But unfortunately, we don't have time. So thank you very much, Mr. Adedakwo. We appreciate your time. Thank, thank you for you. joining us on Channels. Thank Bitcoin. you. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next is the concluding part of last week's interview with Festus Adedayo, who is a journalist, newspaper columnist, media intellectual, and lawyer with a PhD in political communication. He's the author of this fascinating biography titled Ayinla Omowura. Ayinla Omowura was a legendary mu Yoruba musician who popularized Akpala music, one of the most notable types of Yoruba music. On the last episode, Festus Adedayo joined us to explore his biography, and we promised to conclude the interview. Like I said, if you are not Yoruba or you do not understand its culture and language, worry not. This is one of those stories whose key points are applicable to everyone out there. It is the story of a stark illiterate with a difficult childhood who turned into a superstar musician and who was eventually, unfortunately, brutally murdered at the prime of his life. Here's the concluding part of our chat with Festus Adedayo. Let me, you sent me um, something which I will, let, let, let's listen to it uh, a little bit. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, let's listen to it a little bit. Then you tell me what he's actually <laughs> saying here. It's a, it's a strange, unique type of music, eh? isn't it? There we go. People who don't understand your vow will find this funny. <laughs> And the way you dance to it, right? Yeah, <laughs> and you need to also uh, use a handkerchief. You'll be flinging the handkerchief. <laughs> and Jebota as well enjoy this kind of music. <laughs> <laughs> So what's it, what's it saying here? Yeah, uh, at some point, Ayala Mawura was accused of being a hater of women, uh, a misogynist, if you like. Because if you go through most of his songs, he was always attacking the female gender. And uh, one of them is this song. He was always attacking the female gender. Exactly. Uh, like this song now. Uh, in the course of his commentaries, he became a scourge, so to speak, for the emerging fad of the moment, which was bleaching, yeah. uh, skin bleaching in the 60s and the 70s. So in the 70s, rather. In this song, it was saying that women who bleached their skins were very queer human beings. That why would God give you a natural skin and you want to look like an Oibo man? Even against his son, son rather, uh, Akim, his first child, he sang when he was becoming a truant. Uh, if you listen to his song, which he entitled... Sang against his own son. His own son. Uh, his, his own son. And so that was the kind of person he was. He, he, he used society as a basis of his oh, criticism. Oh, 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 yeah, so, and aside that, you know, he was also commenting on social... For instance, when Nigeria conducted the census of, I think, 1974, Ayla Moura did a commentary on census. When Nigeria changed from uh, right-hand driving to left-hand driving, I think, was it mm -hmm. right-hand to left-hand driving? Yeah. Ayla Moura sang about it. So it became a, it became a social commentator. It became a social... And, and in fact, for somebody music. who didn't go to school, at some point in that Udoji, he said, Eje kasan wo udoji no fa won private companies kire o kare. It was you wonder, somebody who didn't go to school was advocating that you shouldn't cater for the public sector alone. Let's cater for okay. the uh, private sector as well. In in incredible. But his, his death was tragic. It was tragic. He was killed by his own band, band manager. Manager. Tragic. Very tragic. And, and I understand, I mean, from your book, they were quite close. They were very good what, friends. What, what, what happened? Yes, uh, Fatai Bayewumi. In fact, I, 
his, uh, his band manager. His band manager. Uh, there was an interview I had with his son, uh, his surviving son, Maruf is his name. Of course, he, he said that Ainla was the aggressor in what happened, allegation. Uh, and that they, they were that close. They were that close, according to the song. Yes, and Fatai Bayeumi was a little bit literate. I think they said he dropped out in standard four, or whatever. And he was at some point working in an insurance company. Uh, but uh, there was an allegation that he stole money in the insurance company, and he had to run to the north. And when he got to the north, uh, Joss, uh, to be specific, and he got to Joss, and Aila Maura went and played in Joss and found him and said, ah, my friend, come back. Things are getting better for us. Why don't you join my band to be my manager? And he agreed, and he said, look, I still owe that money they claimed that I stole. And Aila Maura cleared off. Cleared off. He had, of course, he, he, he of course, built wealth from his music. Yes, yes. He was very wealthy. He, he was very wealthy. He had houses. He, he, in fact, he used two brand new Mercedes Benz, At of course, time, procured for him by EMI. Before he died, he had uh, 504. He had a lot of... And his house in Itoko, in Abekuta, is still there. And so there was a particular day. They said it was in December. In fact, I spoke with about three or four sources who confirmed it. They were doing a rehearsal in his house in Itoko. After the rehearsal, they came to his sitting room. And Aila Maura said, one of you will kill me. Mm. And there were about uh, 20 band members there. Baba Ade Wale uh, Luola, the lead drummer, told me that when Aila said, I said, Aila, which one is uh, what killing? Are you, what, are what, are, what are you saying? He said, I mean, what, uh, uh, that I, he meant what he said, that one of the people here will kill him. And so Baba Ade Wale said, be me, be. I was, was, is it going to be me? Aila said, not you. Uh, Jishegiri Badaru, one of the band members said, is it me? He said, not you. And when he got to the turn of Bayoum, he said, you, you are Judas, I am Jesus, you will kill me. Whoa. And so uh, I spoke with one of the wives, surviving wives of Aila Maura, they called the woman, uh, Yagba. And Yagba said on that day, uh, Bayoum got downstairs and was dankers. And uh, he said to her that I'm going to flee from Aila Maura. And she said she was taken aback and said, why would you want to die? I said, Aila Maura said that I will, I will be the one to kill, kill him. him. After that encounter with Yagba, Baye Umi didn't return to the band. Uh, the son of Baye Umi told me that he was repairing the, the, uh, the antenna of his television. He climbed up and fell from the top of the uh, house and injured his leg. And so that took him off uh, circulation for about a month. But the day he felt well and said he was going to have some drink at that beer parlor, he, he, he had the walking stick. And so he went to the beer parlor and it was where, where he was having his favorite uh, uh, bottle of beer. Somebody alerted in La Maura that Baye Umi was at uh, Sikira 2, at the Kola beer parlor at Agoka. And so he took his driver, he drove his 504 down, his driver drove him down there. And when he got there, he told the driver to park, he went inside. He didn't go inside the bar, he just, you know, uh, priced open the, the door and confirmed that Baye Umi was there and told the driver to go and call the police. And so he went back, Bay, he invited Baye Umi outside. Baye Umi came, a, a mug of beer in the right hand and his walking stick on the left hand side. And uh, he came outside. And Aila Mora gripped his clothes. Where is the key of my motorbike? And in the, in the melee, Baye Umi poured the content of the beer in his face. Aila Mora used this agbada to wipe his face and uh, apparently gripped the clothes more. And Baye Umi hit the mug on the side of the head of Elijah Aila Mora. And from my research, what I found out was that when the, when the mug hit him on the head, he went down and he vomited. Uh, you know, he had just taken uh, his uh, uh, breakfast. And that was it. That was it. But before Baye Umi died, he became a born-again Christian in a barra prison. In fact, he was leading the faithful. And the day he was dying, he was going to die, he wore well, the best well, of his clothes. He was hanged, right? Yes, he was hanged. He wore the best of his clothes. He held a Bible as a match to the gallows and was executed, I think, uh, maybe 1984 or 1985. Incredible story. Uh, <laughs> first, first, 
Well, we have to end it here because of time. Thank you. Amazing story and great effort for you to have reached this. And I, I wish and hope a lot of more people will write books like this. We need to keep stories like this. Thank you. This is a story for the movies. Thank you. But unfortunately, <laughs> um, it's a tragic one. Thank you very much for joining us on Channel's Book Club. It's a great pleasure to Thank be here. You. Thank you. Great Thank to you. have you here. Thank you. I hope you have had a good time with us today. As always, we'll be delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. I'm Olakunle Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.